Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Biologic Podcast. Today's show is episode 106, and we're going to learn all about the evolution of the cephalopods. And then we're going to go a bit farther and explore the clade's most basal living branch, the nautiloids. Now, this episode on early cephalopod evolution and the nautiloids is part one in a two part mini series on the cephalopods. In the next episode, in part two, we'll explore the evolution, physiology, and ecology of the other branch of cephalopods, the coleoids, which includes well known animals like the octopus and the squid. These are amazing creatures, and both episodes in this cephalopod mini series will be pretty mind blowing, and hopefully, they'll change your perspective on these incredible animals and the ocean biomes and ecologies in which they live. For now, let's turn our focus to the nautiloids, which are a manifestation of an old, strange branch in the cephalopod family tree. It's represented today by a mere two living genera. The evolutionary origin of this nautiloid lineage goes all the way back to a time so ancient that the modern descendants, which look much like their ancient ancestors, are referred to as living fossils. Let's follow the evolution of the nautiloids across their entire history to see how they became what they are today. This will inevitably include an exploration of cephalopod evolution generally. So this episode will also be a very good intro into the basic physiology of the octopus, squid, and cuttlefish, which I'll cover in the next episode in Cephalopoda Part 2. Alright, so with all that said, let's wind back the clock to the evolutionary origin of the cephalopods and the nautiloids. At the beginning of the Cambrian period, around 540 million years ago, it's believed that the earliest ancestors of the mollusks were starting to appear. Now, I talked about this in Bits and Pieces in episode 86, which was a general overview of the mollusk clade, and I talked about it a bit more in episode 103, which was literally all about early mollusk evolution and some of the most basal lineages that live today. I'm going to revisit some of this material, but we're going to get through it pretty quickly, and then we're going to transition into the evolution of the cephalopods specifically, which I did not cover in episode 86 or 103, beyond just some basic details. Some 600 million years ago, well before the Cambrian explosion, a primordial clade of protostome animals had emerged from the early evolutionary experiments in multicellularity. These animals, these initial complex macroscopic multicellular eukaryotic organisms, were, at first, simple worm-like or slug-like things, with a mouth at the front ringed by feeder tentacles. They used a primitive muscular foot pad to push themselves through the muck of the seafloor as they sought out detritus and prey. They, too, were preyed upon by larger organisms, and by 575 million years ago, they'd evolved mineralized shells along their backs as a rudimentary form of protection. This produced the ancestral stock population that would give rise to the modern mollusks. Soon, a successful offshoot, a lineage that had branched off and established itself, would eventually evolve and diverge and give rise to the bivalves and the gastropods. The bivalves, for example, would evolve to overdevelop their shells until it formed two hinged plates that fully enclosed the soft tissues of the body. The gastropods did not go this far, but instead they kept some of their soft tissue outside of the shell, like the foot, although it could be withdrawn into the shell for protection when needed. For today's topic, we're going to focus on the ancestral stock or stem group populations that would eventually give rise to the cephalopods. As a general trend that began about 500 million years ago and lasted for about 80 to 100 million years, the mineralized shells in these stem group cephalopods would evolve to become larger, longer, taller, with a pointier tip. They would have looked kind of like slimy cones or wizard hats roaming around on the seafloor 
and at their base, large proto-molluscan eyeballs protruded over a nest of facial tentacles, and dangling in the rear was a siphon-like organ. During the late Cambrian period, these stem group cephalopods evolved septa, which are like walls or crossbars within the conical shell. And these septa helped to support its shape and make it sturdier and more protective. As evolutionary forces tend to seek energetically stable or efficient forms, the septa were soon organized into walls separated by small gaps. And this, this pattern of septa, gap, septa, gap, ran down the length of the shell. Crossbar or thick portion septa soon grew into complete horizontal plates. These septa plates created distinct chambers within the shell, which are smallest near the tip, and they get larger with the septa more widely spaced closer to the broad end of the conical shell. These septa and the chambers that they formed were a really important adaptation. They made the shell stronger and more resistant to crushing forces. But the true evolutionary value of these chambers was not yet apparent. That would follow with the evolution of the siphuncle, or the siphuncle. This is a really fascinating organ, and it's one of the distinguishing features of the cephalopods. While the siphuncle itself is soft tissue, and so it, doesn't, it typically doesn't fossilize, the presence of the siphuncle can be inferred by particular internal notches, or grooves, inside the shell chambers. The presence of a siphuncle is how, for example, paleontologists can differentiate between ancient gastropods, like slugs and snails, which don't have a siphuncle, from ancient cephalopods, like ancestral ammonites, squids, and nautiloids. So what's the purpose of this strange piece of soft tissue? What's the purpose of this odd organ? The siphuncle evolved to drain water out of the shell chambers as the cephalopod grows. In effect, the cephalopod can increase the salinity of the blood in the siphuncle, and this makes the blood absorptive of water. Of course, this transport goes two ways. So, while water is flowing into the blood vessels of the siphuncle through osmosis, gases in the blood, like oxygen, CO2, and nitrogen, are diffusing out and they're moving into the shell chambers. This is a slow but energetically passive process that removes water from the shell and fills it with gas, which makes the shell lighter and more buoyant. With the siphuncle, the shell can be turned into a static flotation device. The true evolutionary value of these chambers and the integrated siphuncle is that they allowed the early cephalopods to lift themselves up off the ground and swim. No longer were they bound to the seafloor. The cephalopods could now use their shells not just for protection, but also to float. And once they could float, their tentacles and siphon tubes could be used for propulsion to allow them to engage in directional swimming. The shell of the Nautilus offers several advantages, but also a few limitations. For example, this siphuncle works slowly. The Nautilus cannot use this organ or its shell like a swim bladder to change its depth on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Changing the shell's buoyancy takes a long time, so the Nautilus is forced to find a suitable depth and then linger there for at least some time. This is really important, because even though the shell is reinforced with these you know, multiple septa throughout the structure, it still can't withstand high pressures. If the nautiloid descends too deep to around, say, approximately 2,600 feet, the pressure there is so great that it can implode the shell and kill the nautiloid instantly. Oddly, the nautiloid is not phased or harmed by low pressures like if it was brought out of the ocean onto the surface of dry land. Virtually every other deep-sea creature is used to the pressure of the water depths, and if you bring them to the surface, they deflate, or they collapse, or they otherwise get mortally injured. But the Nautilus is an exception to the rule. I should also mention that there was great diversity in the shells of these stem group cephalopods. Depending on the family or the genus, 
The shells evolved all manner of forms. Some had conical shells that turned into long, thin, spiraling needle shells. Others evolved more tube-shaped or dome-shaped cells, or cones that bent or curled or twisted, sometimes to the side, sometimes to the back, and sometimes they curled forward over the head. There's a handful of particular shell shapes, like a long, thin, spiraling cone, or a coiled conch, which were independently evolved multiple times. So this tells us that some forms had distinct evolutionary value, or fitness value, uh, relative to other shell forms. Those shell shapes that had greater advantages, or greater fitness benefits, or protective benefits, or what have you, those were independently evolved more often. This is convergent evolution. Whereas those shells that were less effective, or had uh, lesser fitness benefits, they may have still been evolved as part of some evolutionary experimentation, but over hundreds of thousands and millions of years, as selective pressures played themselves out and the fittest survived and outcompeted the others, many of these more obscure and cryptic and unusual shell shapes were phased out, and more stable forms, more evolutionarily optimized forms, persisted. In addition, these animals also evolved cameral deposits, which are buildups of mineral inside the shell, usually near the tip of the shell, so farther away from the body. And this acts as a counterbalance to the heavy, wet, fleshy tissue protruding out from the base of the shell. The cameral deposits weighed down the far tip of the shell so that the cephalopod could more easily orient itself horizontally allowing the hydrodynamic shell to slice through the water as the cephalopod propelled itself with its siphons and its tentacles. This physical feature also helped to balance the cephalopod by bringing the center of gravity of the shell more towards the middle of the body. This improved the agility, the maneuverability, and the speed and efficiency of their swimming. A couple major examples of these early Cambrian cephalopods include the very primitive Plectronoceras and its kin, and descendant groups like the Elesmeroserida. I mention the Elesmeroserida here because, among all of these very early shelled cephalopods that dominated the Cambrian period, all of them were wiped out in the end Cambrian extinction event. All of them, except for a small handful of Elesmeroserida species. This small handful of survivors would become the founders of the nautiloid clade, which includes among its ranks the nautilids, the coleoids, and the ammonites. In other words, this small group of end Cambrian extinction survivors, these Elesmeroserida, these basically became the crown group ancestors of the modern cephalopods. As the Ordovician period rolled around, these surviving Elesmeroserida nautiloid clades expanded and diversified. They evolved thicker shells to better withstand the pressure of the water at greater and greater depths, which allowed them to colonize habitats deeper into the oceans and bring with them transformations to these primordial deepwater ecologies. During this period of recovery and diversification and ecological transformation after the end Cambrian extinction, two important clades emerged the Orthocerids, and the Oncocerids. Now, the Oncocerids are really important to today's episode, but I'll get to them in a few minutes. First, I want to cover the Orthocerids, because that'll let me wrap up a loose thread in this story of evolutionary history. The Orthocerids emerged at the start of the Ordovician, around 480 to 485 million years ago. They had a long, tapering, cone-like shell that was either straight or gently curved. There's some debate about whether or not they swam with the body axis horizontal or near vertical, which would imply different modes of hunting behavior. A horizontal orthocerid, for example, could be an active hunter that swims through the water, whereas a vertical orthocerid is more likely to be a slower-moving scavenger, an ambusher, or some kind of hunter that prefers prey on the seafloor. From what I can tell, the consensus seems to be that the early orthocerids were more horizontally oriented, but sources differ. It's been argued that the orthocerids are actually a polyphyletic group, 
in which case there may have been enough diversity that some of the subclades were vertically oriented while others were horizontally oriented. It's hard to tell because early mollusk fossils are really rare and they're somewhat difficult to decipher, and the project of decoding their evolutionary history is still very much in progress. But despite the taxonomic complications, the grouping that we call the Orthocerid clade is noteworthy because some paleontologists believe it to be the last common ancestor of the nautiloids and the coleoids, or the squid and the octopus. However, there are paleontologists who cite other evidence in the form of fossilized radulas and the shape of the first chamber in the shell to argue that orthocerids are more closely related to ammonites and coleoids than they are to the nautiloids, in which case they would not be the common ancestor. The common ancestor would have to have existed earlier, before the orthocerids. In this interpretation of the lineage, the orthocerids would have given rise to the Bactertida, a small order of straight-shelled, mostly vertically-oriented cephalopods. It's suspected that these Bactertida lurked near the seafloor where they hunted by stalking and ambushing prey. I mention these animals because they are the bridge between the earlier orthocerids and the species that would come later. It was through these Bactrotida that the coleoids emerged, sometime in the early Carboniferous period, around 320 to 330 million years ago. In these coleoids, the body axis has fully transitioned to the horizontal, with the tentacles, mouth, and eyes all on one end, and the streamlined conical shell pointing off to the other end. This hydrodynamic shape made the coleoids even better swimmers, as they could now use their siphon jet system and pulsing flaps of their tentacles to propel the tip of their shell through the water, kind of like the prow of a ship. This adaptation for speed is a very important detail that you should keep in mind as we look closer at the slower, less agile nautiloids. Okay, this is all that I'm going to say about coleoid evolution for now. We'll come back to look at the coleoids again, starting at this point in their evolutionary history, in the next episode. This evolution of the coleoids, of the squid and the octopus, that was the loose thread that I wanted to wrap up. This clears the table of everything else but the nautiloids. And this is where that other group comes in. So we were talking about the crown group Lesmerocerida, which gave rise to the orthocerids and the oncocerids. I just talked about the orthocerids and how they gave rise to the Bactrotida and how they gave rise to the coleoids, so now it's time to look at the oncocerids, which are believed to be the direct ancestors of the modern nautilids. The oncocerids emerged near the middle of the Ordovician period, around 465 million years ago. They enjoyed shallow water habitats for much of the Ordovician, but they experienced a dramatic loss in biodiversity and abundance near the transition between the Ordovician and Silurian periods around 450 to 440 million years ago. Fortunately, this severe decline did not lead to their extinction. It was just a rather abrupt but temporary decline, and by the middle of the Silurian period, they had not just recovered, but had attained their greatest levels of biodiversity ever. One of the clades that emerged in this highly successful recovery, sometime in the middle to late Silurian, was the Rudoceratidae, which has been described by paleontologists as the, quote, root stock, unquote, of the modern nautilids. You'll notice that twice now I've said nautilids, and not nautiloids. That's a subtle but important detail in the terminology. Before, we were talking about the nautiloids, which included groups like the squid and octopus coleoids and the extinct ammonites. But now that we've reached the Rudoceratidae in the late Silurian, we're talking only about the nautilids, of the order Nautilida, or Nautilida. Now, as the Silurian period dragged on, the Uncocerid lineages, including the Rudoceratidae, began to decline again. But for a second time, this decline did not lead to their extinction. Instead, they experienced a second resurgence, a second recovery, in the middle of the Devonian period, when they could compete with and prey upon all of the newfound vertebrate fish that had evolved and filled the seas. 
The fish had existed since the Cambrian, but they didn't evolve jaws until the Silurian period, and they would only achieve their golden age with unprecedented levels of biodiversity in the Devonian period, also known as the Age of Fish. By the Devonian period, these Oncocerid lineages had evolved many variations of coiled shells. Some clades had tightly coiled shells, others were more loosely coiled, while others still retained a primitive form of curved but not quite coiled shells. Let me take a moment to point out the advantages of this coiled shell design that the nautilids have. When a coiled shell is being built, it uses material more efficiently, as each new layer of the coil is built on the layer before. Like the cameral deposits, a coiled shell can find a more comfortable, more stable balance between buoyancy and center of gravity. After the second resurgence of the Oncocerids in the Middle Devonian, they began to decline for a third time. And again, this did not lead to their extinction, but to their eventual recovery and subsequent diversification in the Carboniferous period. Although they remained abundant and successful predators, their diversity began to decline in the later Permian period. The end Permian extinctions hit them really hard, but not as hard as other nautiloid clades. The following Triassic period was a very challenging time for the nautilids, and it ended in utter catastrophe. So far, this enormous nautiloid lineage has seen three periods of decline and three periods of recovery, where the emergent biodiversity is as great or greater than it was before the previous period of decline. Unfortunately, this trend, this pattern of minor extinction and loss of biodiversity followed by recovery and a reacquisition of biodiversity, couldn't be sustained forever. This pattern couldn't be continued indefinitely. And during the Triassic, the nautiloids arguably entered another slow period of decline. But this time, there was no recovery. About 201.3 million years ago, something happened to cause the end Triassic extinction event. It may have been an asteroid impact. It may have been some gradual environmental shift. But recent evidence strongly points towards extensive volcanic activity in the central Atlantic magmatic province. This was a region in central Pangaea that would go on to split apart and become the Atlantic Ocean. The volcanoes of the central Atlantic magmatic province pumped out a colossal amount of CO2, altering the climate drastically and acidifying the oceans. Ultimately, this end Triassic extinction event, which so greatly resembled the, the causes and results of the end Permian Great Dying, well, this ultimately led to the end Triassic mass extinction event. This was an unmitigated disaster for the nautiloids, which were hit extremely hard and almost driven to the point of extinction. The ammonites, for example, were hit really hard, and they lost a ton of biodiversity, and they almost went extinct here, but they just barely managed to scrape by. The nautilids experienced an even more harrowing fate. Of all of the lineages that had descended and evolved and diversified from the ancestral Rudoceratidae, of all of the families that diversified and proliferated, that struggled and fought for survival for a hundred million years across the late Devonian, the Carboniferous, and the Triassic, virtually all of them would go extinct at the end of the Triassic, with just one exception the Conoceros genus. The cephalopods of the humble Conoceros genus emerged in the mid to late Triassic, and they looked distinctly like the modern Nautilus. They had the shell coiled up over their head, with a tentacle-rimmed mouth and large, fleshy eyes, and a diamond-shaped head plate covering the gap between the top of the head and the curling shell. All nautilids that survive today are descendants of these Conoceros nautilids, which were, again, the only ones that survived the end Triassic mass extinction. Now, there were some ups and downs for the nautilids after the Triassic, but they never came close to recovering their former Paleozoic biodiversity. In the next episode, I'll discuss the likely reason why, 
because it's actually a really important factor in general cephalopod evolution. I'll explain it in the next episode, mostly in the context of coleoid evolution. Anyway, in the modern day, there's only two surviving genera of the nautilid family. The genus Nautilus, with four living species, and the genus Allonautilus, with just two living species. For a long time, these were thought to be sister clades, although recent evidence has suggested that the Allonautilus genus is actually descended from the Nautilus genus. Briefly, let's take a look at the surviving species. I mean, there's only six of them. And then we'll dive into their ecology and lifestyle. So, to start, let's look at the four species in the Nautilus genus. These are the Nautilus balensis, also known as the Palau Nautilus, which lives near giant coral reefs in the western Pacific. It's a highly active, highly mobile Nautilus that's mostly herbivorous, but it will eat animal prey when the opportunity presents itself. There's the Nautilus macromphalus, or the belly button Nautilus, which lives nearby in the waters off the north or northeastern coast of Australia. And these are the smallest Nautilus species, usually growing only around 16 centimeters in diameter, but they're occasionally capable of growing up to 10 or 11 times larger. There's the Nautilus stenomphalus, or the white-patched nautilus, which lives in the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast of Australia. These are scavengers that tend to stay in deeper water, and they use their chemoreceptors to sniff out food due to the low levels of light and their poor eyesight. And then there's the Nautilus pompilius, also known as the chambered or the pearly nautilus. This is, by far, the most charismatic and most widespread nautilus, which can be found all over the South Pacific and as far north as Japan. It's even been suggested that the chambered nautilus is not one species, but may in fact be many different but closely related species. Now, the second genus, the Allonautilus genus, only has two species. Both of them live near Papua New Guinea and the nearby islands and both tend to prefer deeper waters, usually around 500 to 1,500 feet. Due to their preference for these deeper waters, it can be extremely challenging to acquire or even see a living specimen. As a result, there are tragically few specimens to study, and so very, very little is known about them. In fact, I would argue that less is known about some of these living Allonautilus species than is known about some of the extinct nautilid ancestors, who we only know from fossils. Among the two living Allonautilus species, we have the Allonautilus perforatus, also known as the Bally chambered nautilus. It's the least understood of the six surviving nautilid species. A live specimen has never been found. We only know them from their shells. Curiously, they're the only cephalopod to have ribbing structures along the sides of their shells. And then lastly, we have the Allonautilus scrobiculatus, which also goes by the name Crusty Nautilus, or the Fuzzy Nautilus. They have this name because of their periostracum, also called shell skin, which is a very thick, slimy layer of soft tissue that kind of resembles hair like really matted, slimy, disgusting hair. It's worth noting that the Allonautilus scrobiculatus is often called a living fossil because it's been unchanged for an extremely long period of time. Some estimates are that the Allonautilus scrobiculatus lineage has existed for 500 million years. I'm sure it's been around for a very long time, but personally, I'm a little skeptical of this number. 500 million years is a really long time for a macroscopic multicellular eukaryotic species to exist and experience evolutionary pressures without undergoing any significant changes. It would also mean that its ancestors emerged in the Cambrian period, almost immediately after the evolution of the shell chambers and the siphuncle, and it retained not just a similar physiology, but also a similar lifestyle and habitat this whole time, for half a billion years. Maybe it's just me, but I'm a little skeptical of that claim. I think it's much more likely that this Allonautilus scrobiculatus lineage 
is significantly younger, still old, but younger than half a billion years old. After all, it's, it's got to fit into the greater tapestry of nautiloid evolution. On this note, let's expand to look again at all of the modern nautilus species. All of them are remarkably similar at a physiological level. They all live in the waters of the Indo-Pacific Oceans. But despite this tropical distribution, they don't actually tolerate warm water that well. They prefer colder water, well below 25 degrees Celsius. And they'll only come near the surface in locations where the surface water temperature is generally lower like around Vanuatu and New Caledonia. All of them have similar life strategies. They generally spend the daytime in deeper water, around 300 feet, near the lower levels of giant coral reef-covered slopes. During the night, they'll come up to shallower water to hunt, seek mates, and lay eggs. They do this in deeper water during the daytime, which reflects their preference for cooler water temperatures. Their tendency to come up to shallow water to the, the more fertile areas of the coral reef at night is because fish are generally less active at night. The nautilus can hunt while avoiding competing with the fish for prey, and to avoid being preyed upon by larger fish. Part of the reason why they may want to avoid fish is that the fish are faster than they are. The coiled shell shape gives the nautilids some stability but it's not designed for speed. The Nautilus evolved a jet propulsion system like the squid and the octopus and cuttlefish, but it's nowhere near as sophisticated or as effective. This means the Nautilus are relatively slow and not agile. Due to these functional consequences of their uh, coiled shell shape, the Nautilus have evolved shell camouflage, as well as low-energy hunting strategies and eclectic diets. So let's start with the camouflage. The Nautilus just aren't fast creatures. They're never going to win a race with almost anything else, maybe against a slug or a seahorse. But generally speaking, camouflage is a better strategy for them than trying to outrun predators. As a result, the top of their shells and the top of their whole bodies are generally darker colored, with heavy pigmentation and irregular striping. This pattern obscures them and makes them difficult to see for any predator that might be swimming above them looking down. From the other direction, the nautilus is pale and lightly pigmented along its belly and underside, which lets it blend in with the sand of the seafloor if viewed from the side, and which blends it in with the lighter upper layers of the water column if viewed from below by some lurking predator. As for their diets, the nautilus generally don't chase down prey with speed or brute force. Instead, they use methods like slow stalking, or hiding in wait and then ambushing their prey when it comes close. They also generally hunt low-effort prey, like things that are significantly smaller and slower than them, like tiny crabs that they can pluck off the seafloor, and smaller, slower fish that they can snatch right out of the water. Should a convenient opportunity come by, where the Nautilus can catch an easy meal, it'll do so. But if it requires any more than a little bit of effort, then the Nautilus will abstain and wait and search for food elsewhere. On this note, the Nautilus are also prolific scavengers, who will eagerly chew up the bodies of dead fish and marine mammals, as well as the molted exoskeletons of crabs, prawns, and lobsters. Whatever food item the Nautilus happens to find, it'll begin the meal by grabbing the food with its facial tentacles, which are called cirri. The cirri are muscular appendages that can tightly grasp onto an object or a prey item. The cirri are surprisingly strong. If a prey animal were to somehow escape, it would have to be able to rip off the cirri, as this is more likely than the Nautilus actually letting go. So basically, if you're a fish, and a nautilus gets you in its tentacle grip, you're going to have to bite off these tentacles or somehow rip them off to, to escape because you're not going to be able to wiggle out of them you know, wrestling style. You're not going to be able to exhaust it or uh, tire it out. If it's got you, it's got you. You're going to have to break its body to escape. Now, you might be wondering, 
why do they have such strikingly powerful tentacles? Well, unlike other cephalopods, the Ciri on the Nautilus do not have suckers or other structures designed to adhere or latch onto an object. It's intuitive to compare the Nautilus Ciri to the arms of an octopus, but this is actually not entirely accurate. The Ciri are smaller and less dexterous than an octopus's arms. And where an octopus only has eight arms, and a squid has eight arms plus two longer tentacles, the Nautilus can have anywhere between 60 and 90 Ciri, but this varies between species, and it even varies within a species. There's also two pairs of specialized Ciri mounted around the eyes. These Ciri are grooved and equipped with lots of cilia, increasing their surface area tremendously. This has led researchers to suspect that they have a sensory function, like chemoreception, so that they can smell or taste the water around them, and perhaps detect prey or the direction of prey. The Nautilus really depend on their chemoreceptors, because their vision is pretty bad. Their eyes are quite large and distinctive, and unique. But they lack a lens. Instead, their eyes use simple pinhole technology, which can really only be used to make simple images with general blocks of light. They can't perceive complex images, because their eyes are just not sophisticated enough to capture complex, high-resolution, high-fidelity images. Unlike the gastropods, the Nautilus do have ears, and they can hear stuff, although I'm not sure to what degree. The ears are little more than oval-shaped clumps of cells, heavy with calcium carbonate crystals, perhaps used to sense sound vibrations pulsing through the water. Aside from the Ciri used for sensory purposes, the bulk of the Ciri are used for feeding, to grab and hold on to plants or prey animals. Prey that's captured by the Ciri gets carried to the mouth. Like the other cephalopods, the Nautilus have a beak. Aside from their shell, the beak is the only hard part of their body. When prey is brought to the beak by the tentacles, by the Ciri, it gets ripped apart and consumed. The Nautilus digestive system is pretty standard for mollusks, with the notable detail that the stomach prioritizes crushing over chemical breakdown. Your stomach, for example, uses hydrochloric acid to degrade proteins. It's a chemical process. But the Nautilus stomach uses muscles to crush and grind the food in its stomach. It's much more of a mechanical process. This may be because the food items that a Nautilus usually eats are typically pretty soft. Think like plant detritus or living plants, or rotting fish, like fish detritus or uh, uh, detritus from marine mammals. And on the occasion where they eat something that has a shell, like a small crab or a, a prawn or something, this crushing action could grind up and destroy the shell and expose a lot of the softer tissues. And in all of these food items, from the plants to the detritus to the ground-up crustaceans and whatever, all of the softer tissues are probably much easier to dissolve and break down and absorb. And so the Nautilus doesn't need to invest a lot of chemical energy and resources into producing like hydrochloric acids and digestive enzymes and stuff like that. Because you just crush it a little bit, you know, mechanically break up your food a little bit, and that's all you need to do. The rest is pretty easy to absorb from there. Nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream and then distributed throughout the body via a closed circulatory system. Compared to the vertebrates, these cephalopods have a super weird circulatory system. The Nautilus heart has four ventricles, which is twice as many ventricles as you have, and these pump blood through four aortas, which is four times as many aortas as you have. Another fascinating detail is that the Nautilus and all cephalopods don't use hemoglobin in their blood. They don't have iron in their blood at all, like you do, like mammals and most other vertebrates, and they don't have iron in their blood. Unlike virtually all of the vertebrates and most of the invertebrates, the cephalopods don't use hemoglobin. They don't have iron in their blood. Instead, they use hemocyanin which integrates copper atoms instead of iron, and this makes their blood 
blue instead of red. Unlike the other cephalopods, the nautilus don't have a particularly large or well-developed brain. In the nautilus, the nervous system forms a largely undifferentiated ring of ganglia, with nerve fibers running off in all directions to innervate the organs and sensory structures and the tentacles and whatnot. They have more long-term memory than researchers initially assumed, but not by much, and they don't appear to have specialized brain regions. Or, I should say, they don't have specialized regions in the ring of ganglia that might be responsible for higher learning or abstract thought or something like that. Compared to their coleoid cousins, the nautilus just aren't that intelligent. Although you could make a compelling case that this isn't a fair competition, because the coleoids, particularly some octopus, are among the smartest animals on the planet. However, the nautilus make up for this intelligence deficit by having remarkably long lifespans, sometimes over 20 years in the wild, which is way longer than the lifespan of typical squids and octopus. This long lifespan is rather awkwardly proportioned, as the nautilus takes up to 15 years to reach sexual maturity. On the topic of sex, the nautiluses are sexually dimorphic, both physiologically and in the population distribution. Females are relatively rare, while males appear to be overproduced, as they are extremely common in comparison to females. To reproduce, the male nautilus will use his penis-like organ, called a spadix, to transfer sperm into the female's mantle. The sperm will be ingested, where it will fertilize a large number of eggs. And up to once a year, the female can get pregnant, and then she'll produce a clutch of eggs. The female will cement these eggs to a rock or some other hard surface, where they'll stay for the better part of a year before hatching into juveniles, who then grow big and old on a diet of crabs and fish and plants before finally reaching sexual maturity and reproducing on their own. All right, everyone, this was a beast of an episode, and super fun, too. The cephalopods are such a wild group of animals, and the nautilus, I think, are a particularly underappreciated and poorly understood faction of the cephalopods. As we learned in this episode, the nautilus are both dynamic and unchanging, in the sense that their evolutionary history has been marked by multiple cycles of decline and recovery, but many individual lineages appear to be unchanged across many millions of years. There is certainly a cryptic, mysterious, and utterly fascinating branch on the family tree of life. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, then you have to do two things. Hit that like button so you can pump up this video in the algorithm, and hit that subscribe button so you can listen to every episode I post right when I post it. And if you liked this episode on the Nautiluses, then you'll really want to subscribe because the next episode will finish up this two-part miniseries on the cephalopods by exploring the coleoids, or the squid, the cuttlefish, and the octopus. We'll start out right where we left off here, where the primordial orthocerids gave rise to the ancestral coleoids. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can become a supporter on Patreon. Tell your friends and family about the podcast. Share it with your science teachers and your online communities. Any way you choose to support the podcast really helps, and I definitely appreciate it. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Oh.